Chapter 11, The Relief of Fort Peace. F.D. Peace had gone out and tried to establish a fort on the Yellowstone. But word came back to Bozeman that the fort had run into serious trouble. Dreams of a new opening for settlers had run into a nightmare. No settlers appeared, but swarms of Indians did. The military post with Pease had fondly hoped for never materialized. The Sioux declared unrelenting war on Fort Pease. Then the Sioux War broke out. Life at the fort became a series of skirmishes with hostile Indians. With the crack of the rifle, the most familiar sound, augmented now and then by the boom of a cannon, an iron six-pounder which thundered over the valley. The men at the fort owed their present survival mostly to the cannon. This incessant warfare imposed severe suffering on the small garrison. Although many an Indian bit the dust, six of the fort's defenders had died, and nine others sustained serious injuries. When the garrison had been reduced to 28 men, they appealed to Fort Ellis for relief. General Terry took immediate action and dispatched Major Brisbane at the head of four companies of the 2nd Cavalry. Militia had been working for the Army, and now General Terry made him wagon master of the supply train that must accompany Major Brisbane. On Washington's birthday, 1876, Lisha bade his bride of two months goodbye and set off on another dangerous mission. Since Chat and he lived in a house which Elliot and Susan shared, he knew she would be well cared for and fully employed with Elliot's family. Lisha had been over the trail many times when freighting goods from Bozeman. He knew every hillock Chuck Hull and Ford. His knowledge proved fortunate indeed. For this February, the trail lay heavily under deep snow. When the caravan drew near the summit of Bozeman Pass, the wagon drivers found such deep snow that some of the wagons had to be helped over the pass by extra mules. On descending to the Yellowstone country, they discovered the snow almost gone, and traveling became less difficult. But every mile they traveled exposed them to greater danger. The Indians of the whole area had risen in fury against the white settlers, and especially against Fort Peace. As wagon master, Lisha rode his horse everywhere through the train, watching for any trouble with the wagons. With constant attention, he managed to keep the supply train rolling along smoothly. After three days of travel, the train camped at the remains of Fort Howie. Now Major Brisbane went on ahead to the Crow Agency, where he expected to pick up Crow Scouts for the remainder of the trip to relieve Fort Pease. He promised to wait for the supply train at the agency. Now Lisha must take his 42 wagons over the Yellowstone, which measured about 100 yards across the ford. Although not deep, the current ran swift, and every team and wagon must be kept within the strict limits of the ford or they might get in water too deep for the animals to pull the wagons. Lisha wondered about some of the horses, but by using dependable wheel teams, they managed to cross the ford without accident or much loss of time. Lisha now received a message from Major Brisbane that he had finished his business at the Crow Agency sooner than he expected and would now meet the supply train at a point lower on the Yellowstone. 
When Lishi and his drivers overtook the cavalry, they found the camp almost empty. The officers and men had all gone fishing. The wagon train made camp a short distance from the army tents. When the soldiers came back from their fishing trips, they brought enough fish to supply four companies of cavalry as well as the men in the supply train. Cavalrymen packed fresh supplies and left early the next morning. Lisha pushed on with his train as fast as he could because he knew the urgency of the relief mission. The wagons would be needed to evacuate the wounded and carry supplies for the men. Snow began to fall, and a north wind chilled the drivers. They got down from their wagons and walked along, swinging their arms and stamping their feet, but the wagons rolled on. Before Major Brisbane reached Fort Pease, the Indians had retired. The relief expedition found the garrison worn with loss of sleep and wearied from constant battle. The survivors gladly accepted the opportunity to leave. Lisha distributed the men among his wagons and saw that they experienced as little discomfort as possible on the homeward journey toward the Gallatin. One evening after the wagon train had made camp, a a rider rode into the circle. Lisha recognized him as Mitch Boyer, the well-known Indian scout, guide, and cowboy who had been at Nelson Story's cow camp the day he had stumbled in nearly starved and more dead than alive after his escape from the Sioux. Lisha welcomed Mitch, and the men sat around the campfire telling stories. Say, Lish, Mitch turned to him, have you seen Kelly? No, I haven't seen or heard of him since the night the Sioux surprised us and took me prisoner. I saw him last fall, Mitch said. He was fixing to trap wolves this winter. He stopped at the agency for a couple of days. He asked about you. What did you tell him? I told him you came into camp starving and dragging one leg. Mitch's eyes danced. After he got through cussing the Sioux, he said he'd sure like to see you. Late that evening, when everyone had quieted down for a few hours of sleep, Lisha thought about Kelly. He felt glad that his fellow scout had survived that ordeal with the Indians. At 7.30 the following morning, Lisha had the supplane train rolling, and a few more days brought the wagons to Bozeman Pass, where they descended into the Gallatin Valley at home. Pisa's effort, doomed though it had proved to be, did contribute to the overthrow of the Cheyenne and the Sioux Indians in the settlement of the Yellowstone. The Sioux War came on, and the Indians refused to return to their reservation, even when ordered by the army to do so. A short time after Lisha returned from his trip to Fort Pease, five companies of soldiers came marching through town on their way to Fort Ellis. They planned to join other soldiers at the fort, and together they would proceed to the Yellowstone to search out the defiant Sioux. General Custer would meet them on the Yellowstone with a company of soldiers from Fort Lincoln. Excitement spread through the town. All the citizens of Bozeman rejoiced. Now surely the front door to Montana would be open again, and the wheels of progress could roll forward once more. All through the summer and fall of 1876, the news of the Sioux War disturbed Lisha. General Sheridan had sent three columns of soldiers under Generals Cook, Terry, and Gibbon, to crush Sitting Bull and his Sioux warriors on the Yellowstone. First came the report of General Crook's repulse before Crazy Horse. Then shortly after came the horrifying news of Custer's disaster. The Sioux 
reinforced by rain in the face, with a thousand Cheyenne warriors, had surrounded Custer's band and annihilated them. Custer had been outnumbered 20 to 1. General Reno, a subordinate officer who had attacked the upper camp of the Sioux, suffered a major defeat, and only prompt relief from General Terry and General Gibbon saved him and his men from destruction. In the fall, word trickled back to Bozeman that Sitting Bull and about 3,000 of his followers, after looting the army all summer, had escaped into Canada. Every citizen in Bozeman followed the news of the campaign with tremendous interest. Lisha often felt hemmed in and cooped up. His free spirit longed to be with General Terry's men over on the Yellowstone. He yearned for the wild plunge into danger. In October of that year, Lish and Chat welcomed their firstborn son, Charles Ernest. The advent of the new baby wrought a surprising change in Alicia that astonished all his friends. Now his interests became domestic and centered round his home and family. He knew that no finer boy than his Charlie had ever been born in Montana or in the whole United States. Two years later, Nelson Lee was born, and Lisha took a fresh look at his town, the place where his children would grow up. A fine class of settlers had been attracted to Bozeman, both in the farming and the business developments of the Gallatin Valley. He approved of what he saw. Nelson's story, now a prosperous man with three cattle camps on the Yellowstone, owned and managed the Gallatin National Bank. The State Agricultural College in Bozeman owed its establishment to a gift of land and several thousand dollars from Nelson's story. Perry McCod, one of the men whom Elliot and John Bozeman had persuaded to leave the wagon train and settle in the growing town, how not, had now become an important citizen. His flour mill and other enterprises contributed much toward building the town's present prosperity. He became a member of the state legislature. Both Lisha and Elliot's family still lived in the big log house that Lisha had built the year he and Chat married. And now that Chat's younger sister, Letty, had come to live with them, the little boys seemed certain to be spoiled by too much attention. It was at this time that Elliot began to build a new brick house. Licious family of little ones brought much joy to Elliot's wife, Susan. She had no children of her own and took great delight in helping chat with her work. One day, while Chad and Susan scrubbed clothes, Charlie, then about three, came to them all excited and repeated words which they found difficult to understand. A and all. Followed the excited child, and he led them to a place where a post hole had been dug, where they found Lee, Charlie's little brother, head first in the po post hole. They pulled him out, brushed off the dirt from his clothes, and rejoiced to find the baby unhurt. Then they understood what Charlie had been trying to tell them. Lee in a hole. Indians often traded in Bozeman, and among them came non-treaty tribe of the Nez Pierce to buy rifles and ammunition. They had always been more or less friendly, but they refused to be bound by treaty to a reservation. Most of the white settlers thought well of them. Now the pressure of advancing white settlements began to affect even the Nez Pierce and brought on 
increasing friction which threatened the peace. The government commission appointed to hear the complaints of the Nez Pierce decided against them and decreed that they must accept confinement to the Lapue Reservation in Idaho Territory. In 1871, General Howard had orders to remove all non-treaty treaty Indians to the Lapue Reservation and gave the Indians 30 days to comply with government orders. Some of the young warriors, resentful of government interference, murdered some white settlers near Mount Idaho. A military force sallied out to restore order, but suffered serious losses in combat with the Nez Perce tribe. Now the citizens of Bozeman saw the large quantity of firearms and ammunition that it supplied to the Nez Pierce being used against the white settlers. The rebellious Indians would not accept the reservation the government had allotted them. They insisted on possessing their ancient hunting grounds where they had killed buffalo for generations. Determined to have their own way, they decided to take flight from Idaho through Lolo Pass into the Buffalo country of Montana. Several hundred of them made their way into the Bitterroot Valley and on into Big Hole Prairie. At the foot of the Gibson Pass, they camped near the North Fork of the Big Hole River. General Gibbon hastened to intercept them. On August 8, the scouts discovered the Nez Perce camp. The soldiers moved forward during the night and launched their attack at dawn. In the frightful melee that followed, women and children were slaughtered along with the warriors. Lieutenant Bradley fell, fateful, fa fatally wounded. Within 20 minutes, the Nez Pierce camp appeared to be in the hands of the attacking soldiers. But the Indians recovered from their surprise, rallied and began firing from all directions at the soldiers, who retreated to a wooded point near the upper end of the camp. They took shelter behind fallen logs and trees and dug shallow trenches with their bayonets. Here they remained to fight for their lives. The Nez Pierce, however, had only been using delaying tactics while they could gather up their belongings and take flight toward their goal, the Buffalo Country. The United States Army continued the relentless pursuit until September 30, at Bear Paw Mountain, where Chief Joseph admitted defeat and said, I will fight no more forever. Chief Looking Glass, that noble leader of the Nez Perce, when they camped at Bozeman, died in the Battle of Bear Paw Mountain. The arrows had pierced Custer's breast, making Sitting Bull's doom certain. The names of General Crook, Gibbon, and Miles became household words in Montana. Now the defeat of Chief, Chief Joseph had subdued the Western tribes from Idaho Territory. The settlers began to feel and act like permanent citizens. The peace, thus peace came to Montana Territory. Now when the Indians appeared in Bozeman, they came only on peaceful errands.